promise me. You'll never talk to Aerith again. Please. You got it. Thank you. You can see the sky. They're still working on the new plate. I don't like this part of Midgar. Back when they were still building Midgar, there was an accident, and the plate fell. People had only just started moving in, so there weren't a lot living there at the time, but... To the best of my recollection, there wasn't anything in the original game about one of the plates having fallen during construction. I guess it kind of makes sense though in this game, they're going to want to go and flesh out the lore of Midgar a little bit, because that was something that was rather thin in the original game. And that's... The underside of Sector 6, Wall Market, a real special place. But I'm sure you already knew that, right? I didn't tell you? I enlisted pretty much right after I left home. Don't know much about this place, or any of the slums. Well, it took a lot of people to build Midgar, and they all needed to blow off steam. So some traders built an entertainment district. Inns, shops, bars, the works. Folks started pouring in from all over. Business was booming, money was flowing, which attracted the attention of some guys who didn't much care for the law. And now there isn't any. Right. But instead of trying to solve the problem, the government decided to just wall it in. And that's how Wall Market began. Out of sight, out of mind, as the old saying goes. For the folks in charge, there's no better way to deal with it. So it's like a giant veil. Yeah. Want to see what's behind it? Not really. That's good. Because I know a better way to get to Sector 7. One that, tragically, doesn't go through Wall Market. And it's just through this tunnel here. At least it was. Back to kid. There is a way of getting to Sector 7 from Sector 5, as I've seen a little bit later on in the game, that is a lot safer, a lot shorter, and a lot more convenient, but it involves going through Wall Market. Not that that's really a terrible thing in and of itself. I think the only reason why Aerith is taking Cloud through this long detour is because she wants to spend more time with him. Of course, the actual reason in the game is that they wanted to have a sort of a dungeon section in this part of the game. Now, in the original Final Fantasy VII, there was a short section of a screen or two you had to pass through to get from Sector V uh, to Sector VI, where Walmart is located. But it really only takes a couple of minutes if you fight all the battles. So they had to stretch that out, hence what we're looking at here. It's been like this, you know, ever since the plate fell. And there's no other way? It'll be an adventure. As I had said before, there wasn't really this much backstory to the city of Midgar in the original game. There was nothing that I'm aware of that involved a plate falling. In the original game, Midgar, the city, wasn't complete yet, though. There was a plate which was not finished being constructed. I can't remember which one that was. But you could see, like, a half-built section where you could see through the plate. The Midgar in the original game was more of just a setting, a place for the game to take place. Now, it was kind of unique in the way that they have this city constructed over um, a number of old towns, where you have the sort of, like, the rich and the poor separated by a physical divide of the rich and the powerful are literally over top of the heads of the people that are living down in the dregs of society. Now, I guess maybe I've seen this kind of thing in fiction before, but it's usually like the people live underground. The poor or oppressed people literally live in like subway tunnels or something like that. But this kind of takes it to a new level where the people are, people in power are physically situated over top in some weird construct of hubris and complete disregard for the kind of environmental concerns the people of this planet would have. Adding a little bit of backstory involving one of the plates having accidentally fallen and killed a whole bunch of people sort of adds to that. Adds not just is this a place where the rich oppress the poor or whatever, but it's also a situation where the people who built the city in their complete disregard for the safety 
of not only the people that live below, but the people who would have been on the plate, the construction workers or the people living there, allowed a whole bunch of them to die just because of an accident that I guess it's going to be the result of some kind of a negligence. I don't know if the game's going to go deeper into the event of the plate of Sector 6 falling, but maybe we'll see. Oh, great. Someone's pulled up the ladder. <sighs> I wonder if we can use this. That was something that I thought was really interesting here. Because in the original game, during the path from Sector 5 to Sector 6, you had that short little dungeon crawl there, and there was, for some reason, a giant robot hand lying on the ground over on, like, a broken road. Sort of like what we're looking at here. Now, in the original game, you didn't control it in any way. I'm pretty sure you just ran across its palm to access the higher level. It was completely non-functional, all that. And it always got me, like, wondering or imagining what the hell this could have been for. Was it a construction robot or anything like that? I think maybe a little bit later on in life, I had come to the conclusion that it was really just a kind of an Easter egg foreshadowing the release of Xenogears, which would come out the next year, which featured a lot of oversized robots bashing on each other. So they're like, oh, we got this other big RPG coming out in a year. Let's uh, throw some little nod to it in this game. So somebody went and just drew this onto the map. It was a weird little thing to be memorable to me, because it's really completely inconsequential to the game. It's just a big robot hand that's on one map. It doesn't move, it doesn't do anything. You just run across it, and then you're past it. But it's burned into my memory, and I'm, I wonder how many other people have that same kind of thought. Okay, I, I couldn't figure out what to do, which is why my camera just sort of panned around for a little while. You actually do need to control this thing to pick Aerith up and move her. It's this way. Here's an idea. I'll hop on and you give me a ride. You serious? Absolutely. I'll throw down the ladder for you to climb up after. Now, of course, this only exists in this game as a, a nod to the original. But it does, again, get me wondering what the hell this robot hand is doing here. It's clearly some kind of a construction tool, heavy machinery. But why the hell is it in a collapsed tunnel? And clearly it wasn't busted up like everything else was. So was this built later? Was this part of demolition or part of attempted repairs? I don't know. I'm definitely overthinking this because this has nothing to do with the backstory. This is here only because of a nod to the original. Plus, we needed a little bit of a puzzle in this area. Well, what did I tell ya? You did it! Yeah. <laughs> uh. Hmm? Alright, good enough. Let's keep on trucking. Hmm. Stop. Did we wake it up? Weird little reoccurring gag that keeps happening with Cloud are people, Tifa and Aerith, keep trying to high five him, and he just doesn't respond to it. Which is a little bit weird. I guess they're trying to push the idea that that Cloud is a little bit reserved in terms of his emotion, because this Cloud is definitely a different kind of Cloud than what we saw in the original game. He's less aggressive. He is less, uh, he's more reserved. He doesn't want anything to do with anybody. And he's taken aback a little bit by the kind of personal interactions that people try to have with him. That's why he rejects Jesse the way he tends to or ignores her. The way he sort of, um, uh, I don't know if I want to say he's uncomfortable with Tifa or Air. He's definitely socially awkward when it comes to interacting with these two women. I wonder if someone blocked it off because of all the monsters that kept showing up. Pretty dangerous place for kids to play. Raised in the slums, remember? You're tough. Hmm, that's supposed to be a compliment? I may have mentioned this before, but I'll say it again just because I have to repeat myself a lot because these episodes tend to get pretty long. Cloud is kind of 
a little bit of a childish individual. And then again, all the characters are in a certain way. But a lot of his character development is around his sort of emotional development. He's kind of emotionally stunted in a way. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that he spent the latter part of his teen years sort of locked up in a lab, unconscious. And his entire personality is sort of a construct. He based his personality off the life of his friend, Zack. So, a lot of the ways he interacts with people is awkward, simply because he doesn't have the life experience to have a better understanding of, like, um, interpersonal relationships or anything like that. So, he'll oftentimes come across to a lot of people as being rather abrasive. His personality isn't particularly pre pleasant to a lot of people, especially people who are sort of antagonistic towards him, like Barrett or perhaps the other members of Avalanche. But when it comes to another person, he's sort of like basing his entire interactions with people based on kind of what he expects them to act like. So he acts aggressive towards Barrett. He's less aggressive towards the other members of Avalanche, and then you get characters like Jesse, who seem to have um, some affection for him. Then you have Tifa, who supposedly was friends with him when they were children, so he doesn't quite have the appropriate memories of their childhood that she thinks. So the way he perceives his personality should be unconsciously, I should say, is a little bit off of what she expects of him. Now, he doesn't know Aerith. He never knew Aerith before. He just sort of encountered her uh, back in Midgar. So her entire perception of him is basically just based off of what he perceives a soldier should act like. Now, of course, he bases his personality off of Zack, and Zack was Aerith's um, boyfriend back before he died, back before he disappeared. She never saw him again, she never found out what happened to him, and unfortunately she never will. At least not while she's alive. So he has this sort of personality base of Zack, and that is probably why she finds herself drawn to him. So now you have this guy who is a little bit reserved around most people, and he has... Uh, a few women, three women, I'd say, who are, let's just say, uh, romantically interested in him for one reason or another. And there's some talk that Jessie really isn't, that she's just sort of um, playing the flirtation game with him. But Tifa and Eris definitely are attracted to him. And that's an unfortunate thing for especially Tifa, because... Like I said, Cloud is an emotionally stunted individual, and he doesn't quite know how to interpret her affection for him. Now you compare her to Aerith, who is not subtle, really, at all. She's not subtle at all. And perhaps it's her lack of subtlety and the fact that she doesn't really have any quit in her. He tries to leave her behind a few times, and she just keeps tagging along with him. It's maybe that aggressiveness or that assertiveness that she has, her tenacity, the fact that she's not willing to give up on him or leave him alone for any period of time, that finally is the thing that breaks through that kind of shield he has around himself. A lot of people have different interpretations in the original game about the sort of relationship status. Now, I'm not one of those uh, shipper people. I generally don't give a shit about the relationships of fictional characters, because, hell, they're not real. Even if they were real, what the hell business would have been of mine? But I do think it matters in the context of the story that it takes place in. If a certain relationship between different characters benefits the story in some way, then there we go, it should be in the story. And in this game, a lot of uh, the character development based around Cloud, Aerith, and Tifa are around uh, their love triangle that they have going on there. So it is important for this story. So, getting back on topic, a lot of people have different interpretations about the relationship that the love triangle, what it was, like which person Cloud was actually in love with. And I generally think that it was not quite obvious who the 
character that Cloud was supposed to end up with. Now, obviously, he... I guess sort of depending on how what choices you made during the game. You would have, like, the dating minigame that took place in the Golden Saucer. But I feel like Aerith was the girl that he was going to end up with had she not died. And her death and the seeming meaninglessness of her death has a lot to do with the sort of emotion that the story is supposed to carry. Not half bad. So do you moonlight as a crane operator or something? <sighs> yeah? Huh? Oh no, look. Why is it always gotta be so tough? Lucky for me, you'll make this easier. Yes, ma'am. Well then, I'm gonna head down. Cloud is a kind of emotional dickbag in a lot of ways. He ignores the girl who's clearly attracted to him, not for any particularly good reason, really only because he doesn't know how to respond to her emotions. Some girl finally does come along who manages to... manages to break through to him. And then she dies. And it didn't just affect him, it affected all of the characters that are around them. But I guess it most profoundly affected him, not just because that he was in love with her, but because he felt responsible for her death, responsible for protecting her. And in a lot of ways, although it wasn't his fault, a lot of ways he had a hand in her dying. So there is this love triangle that goes on in this game, and there is this kind of emotional beat of these characters having affection for each other and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of it is really just down to building up the kind of emotions between these characters and even building up the kind of affection the player would have for especially the character of Aerith and then killing her off. And then you find yourself in a position where you're roughly only about halfway through the game and suddenly one of the more important characters in the story is gone. And you don't know why she died. You don't know what she was doing. You don't know why she disappeared and ran off to the City of the Ancients. And what, for what reason Sephiroth decided to kill her. But you do know one thing is that she is gone. And unlike in like Chrono Trigger, where Chrono dies, there is no way of bringing her back. There's no going back on the reality of her demise. And that is probably the most important aspect of this story. You can look at the individual little things that they bring up, like the environmental concerns, or the sort of like economic reality of rich versus poor and all that kind of stuff, and say that this story has a lot of allegory to our real world in regard to those things. But I feel like the most important part of this is the fact that you have this character who dies and everybody else doesn't have some emotional revelation about her death. She doesn't have some big heroic demise, but it's a senseless death. And everybody else has to just go on with their life without her. And that's an unfortunate reality. Everybody, if you live long enough, everybody will lose somebody. And that's an emotion that everybody has to feel. And there's no good way of dealing with it. There's only gradients of bad. Knowing that this game will end in the Midgar section and knowing that they have changed and this, in a little bit in a little ways the way that the game is turning out. They're adding things and changing things around just a little bit. I'm afraid that developers by the time we reach the point in which Aerith dies might lose their nerve but we're only going to have to wait and see.
Anybody around? Guess it's just us. Hmm. It's still warm. Should we relight it? Have our own campfire? I need to get back. Besides... Looky here, boys! Caught us some burglars! Coming into our homes and stealing our shit? Doing crimes? <laughs> I'd say we're owed compensatory damages! <laughs> Cap a minute, a composite, I don't get it! Ah, how stupid can you be? It's crazy simple! <laughs> compensatory damages is like, uh... It's like compensation... For damages! Oh, yeah! <laughs> That's what you get when you... No, when somebody else... We uh, haven't done anything wrong. Yeah, we were just passing through. Oh, a likely story. Uh, okay, what do you... Nothing but our due recompense. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> due recompense. Due recompense. Due... due recompense? Uh, no shit for brains. Due recompense. It's like, uh... uh it's like, uh... uh, 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 uh Compensatory damages! Um, of course, so damages I know that. recompense! I, guess. I, guess. <laughs> I think we've heard enough. I'm a little bit concerned with the potential future of this remake series. Because I feel like the developers are taking a lot of creative license when it comes to changing sort of the history of the game. Where you have certain events happening in a certain way in the original, they're changing it pretty much just for the sake of making it different. Now, I guess that makes sense. This is a remake, not just a, like, a retelling of the story in the exact same way. What I'm afraid of is having already spoke my piece about how important the death of Eris is, that they're going to lose their nerve a little bit. That we're going to reach the point where Aerith is supposed to die, and she doesn't. And I feel like that that will rob the story of probably its most important part. Because uh, whether anybody really thinks about it like that or not, I feel like her death is probably the pivotal moment of the story. And is the one thing that it changes the mood of everything. And really turned a game from what would have been a good game into a great game. I just feel like they're gonna they're gonna rob the remake series of that moment and it's going to be lesser for it. Now I do think there are some potential other options that will happen, and I'll get to that in a moment. Random question, but why did you quit being a soldier? That is random. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. Um, did you have any soldier friends? Any war buddies? No. Not really. Oh, okay. You know, Aerith, if you wanted to know about Zack, you could have just asked him. In fact, he probably could have told her a thing or two. The way his memory works, his memory sort of gets jogged by seeing things or hearing a person's name mentioned. So, had she mentioned Zack's name, he probably could have told her something. Now, he's kind of in denial about Zack's demise. He, even if uh, his memory of Zack had come back, which it eventually will, he won't realize that Zack is dead until quite a while later in the original game, at least. But he at least could have told her something. But she's not willing to just mention his name. Anyway, back to what I was saying. What was I saying? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I can see the eventual scene of Aerith's death going on in a few different ways. Now, the one I think is probably most likely is they're going to, in the same nature of all the different little changes that we've seen, they're going to play the scene out in a lot of the same way it did in the original game, but at the moment that she would have died, she doesn't. Something happens, and she doesn't get stabbed through the back. And they just sort of toy with it, tease, tease it out a little bit, and make you think that, oh, oh, what's happening? She's actually going to survive. And then, once you think you're out of danger, boom, she dies. Something happens, and then Sephiroth ends up getting to her anyway, and then she dies. And they, it'll feel a little bit cheap, but I feel like that's probably what's going to happen. 
another option, I think, a little bit less likely, but likely enough that I feel like I'm going to mention it here, is that they're going to play the scene out the way I described, and then Aerith doesn't die. And then they make you think, like, okay, we're safe now. Then someone else dies. Now, I think that someone else would probably end up being Tifa, which would be, I don't know, in, in the context of the story, in what the emotions, the emotions of what the original death of Aerith was supposed to bring out, won't make a lot of sense. Because Aerith dying in this story doesn't quite mean as much as, or Tifa dying in the story doesn't mean as much as Aerith's death. But they might do that. I say maybe if they wanted to really go balls out crazy, at that moment Cloud could die, and then the game has to take over from that point without Cloud. That would be, that would be bonkers. I guess it is possible if they want to get especially ballsy, but honestly the story would make even less sense if Cloud died in evil, either Aerith or Tifa. But they might do that, just if they really wanted to go crazy. I guess that would be an interesting thing to see what happens after that point. What the other characters do without Cloud, their leader, is suddenly dead. And then you have Aerith and Tifa who have to move on with their lives suddenly without this guy that they were both attracted to. That they were, in a sense, both competing over. Not that there was ever a lot of animosity between the two of them. Stupid ladders. Always out of reach. Okay, Cloud. Heading down. You're in charge of the arm. Got it? The rule of three. It's one of those, I don't know, unofficial rules that I have. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before, but a kind of unofficial rule for game development when you have a mini game or a game mechanic that appears in like a single dungeon or whatever, you do it three times. The first time you do it, it's really simple just to give you the kind of, just to give you a little bit of a taste of the way the gameplay is supposed to work. Then they do it again a second time with a little bit more of a complex puzzle. Then they come around and do it the third time where it is at its most complex and then you have to use all the skills you developed up to that point in order to figure your way through it. The rule of three. You're going to see the same dungeon, or rather the same game mechanic, taking place in the dungeon three times. So this is the third time, and I have to say I don't really give it, I don't really care for this stupid little mini game here with the boxes moving. It's not hard to get through, figuring out your way or all that kind of stuff, but if you want to go and collect all the materia, which of course I had to do, you have to spend a little bit more time with it, figuring out how to move everything around and get Aerith to the positions that you need her to be. Which is unfortunate because a lot of the special little items you get are, I don't want to say useless, but a lot of them are not useful, if that makes any sense. I found myself not buying any materia in this playthrough. In fact, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this and I'm just misremembering something. But I don't recall buying any materia at any point during this playthrough. Which is strange, because in the original game, I did feel the need, especially like if I were to play through it now. The first shop I'd hit, I'd buy a few pieces of materia. And that would probably end up being all of the materia that I end up getting. Make sure I have like the fire and thunder and all that kind of stuff for my characters. And then maybe swap that materia around, depending on what my party makeup is. In this game, they throw so much materia at you that I don't think you really need to buy anything. You're pretty much going to end up with all the materia you need. You know what? I'm misremembering this. I'm definitely doing this wrong. Because Chadley, Chadley sells materia. The weird, like, discount materia. And I bought his materia. So, I'm wrong. That went pretty well. Sure did. Uh. Huh? Wait a minute. Did you just... Nope. Man's finally coming out of his shell a little bit. Went to high five. <laughs> Took her by surprise. And then he just sort of like pretends it didn't happen. <laughs> okay, these bandits that we run across. Not, not these ones here, but the ones we fought earlier and I sort of talked over the entire fight. 
uh, reoccurring secondary antagonists. Hey, I five. Boom. There we go. And we've reached the playground. Looks shut. How do we open it? More importantly, how about we take a break? Sound good? No. I don't have time Up for- Up there looks nice. <sighs> Come on! You know, a long time ago, I used to sell flowers here. Oh, yeah? <sighs> so, Cloud, you were a soldier first class, right? Yeah. Weird. Really? What's weird about it? Nothing. Just that you were the same rank. Huh? As who? The first guy I ever loved. <sighs> What's his name? I probably know him. Because of the Mako. All soldiers have them. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I'm bumming you out. We should go. <sighs> Gotta look forward, not back. Perhaps I was wrong about that. She did mention his name, although we didn't hear it for whatever reason. We didn't hear the name being mentioned. And Cloud had his little reaction. But maybe because of his, the weird little dissonance he has between remembering things when people say, mention, or he sees something, and his sort of emotional blockage of the fact that Zack is dead, and he is just okay. sort of taking over Zack's life in a certain respect is maybe blocking him from having that full recollection, which is why it looked like he was uh, having an aneurysm or something. I know it's stupid, but for some reason I thought it was funny to be able to just run around on the playground and like go through the slides and jump across the tires and all that stuff. It doesn't make any sense. I don't even know why they bothered putting this stuff in here, but I did it anyway. So... Go ahead. You gonna be okay getting home? And if I said I wasn't? I'll go with you. I thought you needed to get back. <sighs> <laughs> Don't worry. I have a backup route for emergencies. And it's safer, too. <laughs> <laughs> 